we are here today. Jay, thank you. We appreciate you for hopping on with us. Um, it's March Madness time, and as we tape this, Selection Sunday is less than a week away. And we're going to talk about men's college basketball with you. And just to start things off, I'm curious how many brackets you personally make this time of year. I only make one. Uh, we do it basically on the air at ESPN. So, uh, you know, if you do multiple brackets, you know, people are going to hammer you. So you, you just do one. <laughs> Okay. What's your biggest piece of advice for folks that are filling out their brackets this year? Well, if you're going to fill out a whole bunch of them, you can do a, a myriad of things. And, and one of them's going to hit uh, because somebody's got to win this thing. Uh, but I think if you're just doing one, uh, one of the things to remember is, is upsets are uh, intriguing to start the tournament and everybody gets worked up over them. But if you're going to pick an upset, uh, over a, a higher seeded team that has a better chance to advance. Uh, the best thing to do is pick an upset where you think the, the higher seeded team is going to get beat in the next round anyway, because you don't want to, you don't want to lose a, you know, blow a final four team uh, over an upset you think may happen. You know, upsets are going to happen, but usually, uh, you, you know, usually they're the ones that nobody can see. Like last year, I don't know who thought St. Peter's was going to reach the elite eight. Uh, other than people that went to St. Peter's or St. Peter himself. Um, uh, th there was nobody that thought that was going to happen. So that blew up everybody's bracket. And as long as those kind of things happen, it's not going to hurt you and yours. But, uh, uh, you know, when you're trying to pick, uh, pick upsets, you go with the ones that are, uh, I would call, you know, the unhurtful ones. So even if, uh, even if you're not correct on that, um, you know, you, you, you're not, you're, picking against a team that's going to gonna lose in the next round anyway. Are there any teams you've particularly been impressed with all season that might not be ranked the way you think they should be right now? Well, I mean, there are a number of teams that I think are really good. It, it, there's a difference, I think, between a team that's good enough to reach a Final Four because that's a, a four-game stretch in, a, in one region and, and a team that can win six games and win the whole thing. Uh, I, I don't think there are all that many teams that can win the whole thing. I think it's like eight, maybe nine. Uh, but reaching a Final Four is a different different thing. There are a number of teams that are capable of that if someone falls down in their bracket and they get a favorable matchup or two to start. Um, but some of the you know some of the teams that um, that aren't seen much uh, on television during the regular season that have done really well, like Oral Roberts is one of them. And I think a lot of fans will remember a couple of years ago, Oral Roberts beat Ohio State in the first round and uh, they were very talented. They had a sophomore guard named Max Asmus, who's now a senior and he scored over 2,500 points. He averages over 22 points a game, but they have a, they have a better team this year than they had that year. And they're similarly flying under the national radar uh, but they're they're really good. They got a seven seven foot four kid named Connor Banover that started uh, you know started his career at a different place. I mean he played at Arkansas and then transferred into Oral Roberts. Uh, so they've got size, uh, they've got depth, and they've got older players, and they're really capable. You're a Duke guy. Do you think that they're a sleeper? I don't know about a sleeper. They're good. Um, they're really good defensively, and they've finally gotten healthy. Uh, they don't score as easily as some other Duke teams, so they're not an offensively powerful team, and they're not a knockout punch team, but they stay in every game. I think of their 31 games, they've held 27 of their opponents under their season average, so they're not easy to score against, and they're they're good around the rim, uh, and uh, and you know they can stay in just about every game. They haven't done as well on the road. They've been blown out a couple times by NC State and I think Miami. But uh, but they're good. I don't know that they're title good, but they're good enough to they're good enough to reach a regional final, uh, maybe a final four. I felt really lucky personally to be able to go to Coach K's last college basketball game as a coach last year. And it still seems weird. He's not there. But I have a serious question for you. Do you think Duke basketball is still Duke without Coach K at the helm? Like, is it is a relevant a death sentence for that franchise? No, no. One, John Shire is excellent. I mean, he's the winningest first year coach in Duke history. Uh, he's already won 23 games. I don't think that's his last win. And they were undefeated at home. Coach K, you know, didn't do that in his uh, his last couple of years. So um, it, it look, he's really good. And and Coach K became like Bob Knight at Indiana or John Wooden UCLA became synonymous with the brand. 
uh, and and that's still fresh. But Duke was a, a great program before Coach K got there. It had been to multiple Final Fours in the '60s and one in the the late '70s, and and it'll be a, a, a recognizable great brand uh, now that he's retired. And the same goes for North Carolina or you know UCLA is still. A great program, and you know, it's never going to be as great as it was when Wooden was there. That was a different time, and nobody's going to win ten championships in twelve years, and nobody did it before, and nobody's going to do it again. Um, so, you know, there. It, it, but it's kind of like Alabama football. I mean, Alabama football was great before Nick Saban got there, fallen on a few years of hard times. But when you've got that sort of history, tradition, and all the resources that go with it, the, the, these 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 brands aren't going anywhere. I know you've backed college athletes getting paid for a long time. How do you feel about the way NIL's played out so far? It's been fine. I mean, you hear a lot of complaining about it from coaches and administrators, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, but it, it sort of strains the mind to think that you can run a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry and expect the revenue drivers, uh, that being the players, to, to work for free. Uh, you know, these schools, they don't admit it, but they employ a lot of students uh, in a lot of different different fields, um, you know, there's a school near me that employs 6,000 students, and uh, and then they they make it sound like it's impossible that that players can make money or that the schools can pay the players. It's not it's not impossible, and uh, it, it's not only not impossible, it's actually pretty easy. They just don't want to do it. And uh, look, if I didn't have to pay my employees, I'd probably be pretty happy too. But uh, but you know, the courts have. have made a pretty clear statement that the way the NCAA has acted with regard to uh, compensation uh, violates federal antitrust law. And I think we're going to see we're going to see that move forward beyond just NIL and off court compensation, and off field compensation in the near future. When we look at the top NBA prospects, four of them don't didn't play in college. And do you think we're facing a future where the NBA looks to G League and other places for their next star players? The NBA is going to look everywhere for talent. They look all over the world and wherever it is, they are going to find it. And uh, so I think the G League overtime elite uh, playing overseas, those are still viable options. They're not for every player, but they're for some of them. And the more players that get drafted, uh, you know, up in the lottery going those alternate routes, the more players in the future that are going to do that. I think for, for those of us that believe that college is the best place for a young adult to be. I'm one of those. Uh, I think uh, I think the NCAA institutions should think long and hard about doing a better job of encouraging young adults to come to college rather than taking an attitude that if you don't want to do it our way, we don't want you at all. Uh, they don't say that in any other walk of life. And I don't know why they would say that to athletes. Uh, I think it's an issue of control more than anything. But uh, and and I think it's a vestige of, of frankly not wanting to pay them. But going forward, if athletes uh, are allowed to be compensated uh, to their fair market value, I think college becomes an even better place uh, for a young adult to to pursue a dream like the NBA or, or the NFL or anything like that. Uh, to me, uh, the idea that a, a young person that goes to college for only a year or two that somehow that's a failure or a waste of their time, I think is is wholly incorrect. I think one year of college establishes a relationship with an institution of higher learning where the, the young person is more likely to go back and, and complete or continue uh, an education. And why why would anybody want to put the brakes on that because of, of optics? I, I think uh, I think the NCAA over the years has made this you know, sort of has has implied that if you don't want to be Bill Bradley or Shane Battier, we don't want you at all. And uh, I think that's not only a, a poor reflection uh, on their values, but uh, but it sends a it sends a really negative message. Back to the tournament. Why do you think we're seeing a lack of dominant blue bloods in the tournament? I think it's one of those years where some of the name brands, whether it's North Carolina or Kentucky, hasn't had the best of years. Um, we've, we've seen, uh, a little more, I don't, I don't use the word parody because parody to me means equality and there's not equality in, in college sports and college basketball, but, uh, there's no knockout punch great team this year. There, there's a, there's a group of teams. I mean, you know, if you look at the top, the top records, uh, they, they've won at a very high rate, 
but um, and usually there are closer games than people think about that, that a lot of times, you know, these games come down to the last several minutes. But whether it's Alabama or Purdue or Houston or UCLA or Kansas, uh, all these teams have have won, you know, won their leagues and won at a really, really high rate. And they're the favorites. They're just not they're just not unbeatable. Um, you know, it's, it's been a, a few years since we had, you know, a few years ago, we had uh, Gonzaga and Baylor as the two best teams. And if they weren't in the final four, I think our jaws would have been on the floor. But this isn't that type of year. Uh, we could have a final four where there's only one number one seed or, or something like that. But and we could have a double digit seed again. Who knows? But um, but I, I think I think it's just one of those years more than anything. Uh, and it's not indicative that somehow, you know, we've reached equilibrium and, you know, anybody that has a, a round leather ball can win a national championship. Hey, sports fans, if you want to see more conversations with athletes and stars, check out these videos right here and be sure to subscribe for more from USA Today Sports.